Have you ever noticed that there seems to be a Chinese restaurant in nearly every town or city in Canada? Have you ever wondered why? Or do you have a favorite dish that you always order at your favorite ethnic restaurant? Or do you have a favorite ethnic restaurant? For me, I grew up in the Canadian prairies and I loved ethnic foods. And for my family, Asian cuisines were our family's favorite way to go out for supper. And looking at my mother's childhood back in the 1960s, when she was a teenager, her family always would go out for Chinese takeout or bring, out, bring in Chinese takeout for New Year's because it was something different. It was a welcome change from all the feasting of the Christmas season. And it was also one of the few restaurants that was always open on New Year's Day. And so today, for me, Thai, Japanese, Chinese, and Vietnamese, these are flavors that are more familiar to me than many Western meat and, meat and potato dishes. Now, have you noticed that the word authentic is often tied to ethnic cuisine? What drives this search for authentic ethnic cuisine? Are we looking for something that is an escape from our everyday meals, something novel? Do we have a wish to experience something that seems exotic? If so, these may stem from old attitudes from colonial and imperial mentalities that are still lingering today. There's still this latent desire to consume and, and devour cultures that are different than our own. Now, when I hear people say authentic ethnic cuisine, they're often implying that Western ethnic cuisine is somehow less authentic. But seeking an authentic cuisine from some imagined faraway place, while dismissing the dishes that are made and created right here, ignores the very real histories and unique contexts of ethnic cuisines in their uniquely North American and Canadian contexts. Now, there's a joke among many Canadians that we don't know enough about our own history. But food might be a way in, because food tells the stories of people from all over the world who have contributed to this place. And so food is a, a vehicle to tell stories. And food shows that people through Canadian history have contributed to this place, even in the face of often legalized government discrimination and racism that has been and is still part of Canadian society in the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries. And so food is a way to our past, but perhaps is also a way forward. Now, my position is one of a European-Canadian consumer. I, appre I appreciate and enjoy the ethnic foods that I eat, but I've never had the experience of being a person of color in Canada. I have never been made to feel like I am an outsider. I've never been classified as ethnic or foreign or treated as a second-class citizen or made to feel invisible in my own country. And scholars who study multiculturalism in Canada often write about the fact that there's still this colonial assumption that white is the general or stereotypical Canadian, while Canadians who are of color are often seen as the others or they are deemed uh, multicultural ethnic minorities and ethnic demographics, and sometimes made to feel invisible. And so my research has focused on unpacking constructions of race in Canada in art and how they still shape our attitudes in society today. And if we look at cultural studies and scholarship in English departments across Canada, we see other scholars like Dr. Lily Cho and Dr. Seneja Genev, who are also exploring multiculturalism and have written about how we could think about the meanings of ethnic foods in Canada. Food symbolizes power and history and personal preference and heritage and flavor, and it speaks so much about our cultural fabric. So food means so much. And specifically, my work looks at artists who use food culture in their practices. For example, Karen Tam and Shia Kasai. In the mid-2000s, both of them were using restaurant spaces and food culture to explore how Asian identities have been negotiated, consumed, and constructed in ethnic restaurant spaces. Karen Tam, for instance, she created installations that looked and felt like real Chinese restaurants in galleries all across Canada. And in every city that she visited, she would meet with other restaurant owners. She herself grew up in a Chinese restaurant in Montreal. And she would use items from their restaurants and construct these spaces to reflect the Chinese restaurant history of that city, looking at menu items and histories and stories and bringing people into the gallery to think about their relationship to these spaces and to these foods. 
With Shie Kasai, she was interested in exploring stereotypes of Canadian culture and how people always asked her, what's the best sushi in Montreal? And she'd say, I don't know. This is Canadian ideas of, of Japanese cuisine. So she made Canadian sushi. She made sushi using Tim Hortons donuts and maple syrup and baked beans and all these kind of stereotypical English or, and, and French Canadian foods and she made Canadian sushi. And so both of these artists are using food as a way to help us think about culture. And so today, I am an art educator and instructor at art galleries and institutions in Vancouver, and I am driven to engage audiences and students with ideas about society and art that still matter and shape our lives. And I love what I do, and I'm driven to create meaningful conversations around these sorts of ideas. And so, as I do with my classes and in my tour programs, let me draw you in. Let's look a little closer at a few familiar dishes from many Chinese menus and Japanese menus that you may already know and love. And let's look and see what we can learn a little bit by looking closer at some of these foods. Hamburgers and fries. When we look at the history of Chinese food in Canada, Western recipes have often been part of Chinese menus. And some people may falsely assume, oh, this means it's not an authentic restaurant. But actually, this is an authentic part of Canadian history. Many Chinese restaurant owners would make Western foods because they knew that their Western audiences in the mid-20th century were more familiar with veal cutlets and mashed potatoes and burgers and fries than a lot of Chinese dishes. So they would serve the dishes they knew their clients wanted. They would try to make a familiar space in their restaurants. And so Western food has often been part of Chinese restaurant history. Maybe you've noticed that there's many Chinese Canadian dishes that are very saucy, with sticky, sweet cornstarch syrups and sort of mystery red sauces. And this sauciness is sweet and savory and sour and delicious for many of us. But most recipes in China are not saucy and thick like this. It's because many restaurateurs here in Canada recognize that Western audiences seem to love gravy. And so they made adaptations to their recipes to bring in this saucy quality to the dishes they served in North America. Spring rolls, a favorite appetizer for many of us. Spring rolls do date back over a thousand years in China, but also in countries all across Asia. And they're long and crispy and deep fried, and they've got vegetables and meats inside. But egg rolls are distinctly North American. These are larger, they're sort of rectangular in form, and they have egg in the recipe, hence the name egg rolls. But they are not served in Asia. They are distinctly a North American adaptation of Cantonese spring rolls. Now, how many of you love ginger beef as much as I do? <laughs> I hear some yeses in the audience. Ginger beef is a favorite for so many of us. Did you know that it was invented in Calgary? It is a Canadian Chinese recipe. In the mid-1970s, there was a chef at the Silver Inn who invented ginger beef. It was a way to modify a northern Chinese dish with chili sauce and beef with the sort of deep fried comfort food of British pub food. And so he combined sort of the fried batter with sort of this chili uh, zesty sauce and he made ginger beef. And since 1970s, ginger beef has spread across Canada. There are variations of this all across the country. And for many of us, it's one of our favorite dishes. But it's distinctly Canadian. It's this example of a restaurateur adapting and creating something new in Calgary. And jumping over to Japanese cuisine for a moment, California rolls. How many of us enjoy California rolls? They are believed to have been invented here in Vancouver by Hidekatsu Tojo, who is a sushi chef. And he's been a sushi chef here in Vancouver for over 40 years. And in the mid-1970s, he created a roll that is now called the California roll because he realized many of his customers didn't really love raw fish yet. And many of his Western customers didn't really love seaweed yet. And so he put rice on the outside and then the seaweed and then some fake crab and he rolled it up and he called it California roll because many of his Californian clients seem to love this roll. And there's other variations in Los Angeles that add avocado as well. So it's very much a Western coastal dish. And this is notable because this dish for many Western people is a bridge for them into Japanese cuisine. For many people, the California roll is their first sushi experience. So this dish is vital for bridging and connecting people from different backgrounds and helping them to enter into the wide world of Japanese cuisine. 
And so when we look at some of the histories of a few favorite dishes, we realize that we can see that the development of Canadian society is reflected in some of these dishes. And so if we ask a question like, why is it that Chinese restaurants seem to be in every town in Canada? We will find that some of the answers are waiting for us when we look at Canadian history. Now, Chinese laborers were brought over in the 1850s to work in the gold rush and then eventually to build the very long and dangerous railroad um, projects that were connecting British Columbia and Vancouver to the rest of Canada. And when the railroad was completed in, at the end of the 19th century, many Chinese workers needed work. But what they realized had happened was the, Chinese gov sorry, the Canadian government had intentionally made it very difficult for Chinese people to work and live in Canada and essentially remind them they were not wanted. And so the head tax was put in place and the head tax made it very expensive for individuals to try to immigrate to Canada because they had hundreds of dollars they had to pay. At the time, it would have felt like thousands of dollars for us. And so this made it very expensive to try to immigrate here in the early 20th century. And then from 1923 until 1947, it was completely illegal for any Chinese person to immigrate to Canada. And for those who were here, they had a very difficult find time finding work because so many cities and provinces had put in legalized racial discrimination laws, making it illegal for Chinese people to work in most job sectors, except for the service industry. The laundries and the restaurants were some of the only businesses they were allowed to work in. And so... Chinese people moved into those sectors, and many people moved eastward. And so as the train now connected the entire country, many people moved east, and they would get out and, uh, and move into small towns, and sometimes open the only restaurant in that small town. And so today there are some remote communities in Nova Scotia where they don't have a Tim Hortons coffee shop, but they do have a Chinese restaurant. And it's this train movement and this migration eastward and this desire to build restaurants and make a living that has spread this, this restaurant across the country. And so we realized by looking at these, these histories that Canada is reflected in these spaces. But interestingly, if we go a little further back still, we find that actually the first Chinese people to come to Canada came in 1788. They came as part of a trade initiation or initiative between China and Britain, a desire to fuel and encourage more trade of the sea otter pelts between Vancouver Island and China. So this reminds us that Chinese history dates back much longer in this country than many European histories. For my family, my father's family came here from England in 1951. And so this shows us that when you think about how difficult many racialized laws and immigration laws were against people of color, these ethnic restaurant spaces may in fact be very vital and even subversive spaces of cultural encounter during a time when laws were trying to exclude people from each other. And so these spaces are vital for making a living, but they're also vital for Canadians of other backgrounds to encounter one another, to understand each other, and to connect. And so every one of us has a role to play in terms of race and culture and cultural experiences and encounters that we have. But if we choose to consume ethnic cultural uh, commodities and foods without caring about context and without caring about history, then what does that say about how much we really value multiculturalism in this country? Do we only value it so far as it can be commodified and consumed as takeout? I hope not. Because if we consume ethnic cultural items and foods without caring about context and history, then restaurant spaces and food become nothing but superficial experiences, uh, a superficial performance of culture, a spectacle made devoid of politics and of history. And I think we can do better than that. I think we can become more knowledgeable and aware and inclusive as Canadians. And I don't say inclusive as a trendy buzzword, but inclusive, because an inclusive society is where multiple peoples and multiple histories are important and are widely known and are valued. And when we really look at Canadian history, we see that history has impacted peoples of different colors and different demographics in very different ways and often very oppressive ways. But these difficult histories intersect and they combine and they lead us to where we are right now. And so these multitudes of histories are Canadian histories. And so ethnic cuisines and ethnic dishes that are served here are not authentic to some imagined faraway country, some faraway place, but they are authentic to this very complicated and nuanced and ever-growing and changing place. They are authentic to here. So let's give some more thought to the foods that we eat 
dig in. Get to know the people who serve you at your favorite restaurant. Learn their names. Learn their names. Be curious about the dishes that you already love. Read a little bit about the people who've written about these dishes and who are sharing history with you. These dishes can mean so much. And especially when you think about it, it's important to really care about the people who've adapted and, and created and served these dishes to us for generations. There's a saying that the way to one's heart is through their stomach. And food is a bridge. And the foods that we already love and we already eat connect us to each other in ways that bylaws and policies and textbooks simply cannot. And when we fully value multiple peoples and multiple histories in this country, then no one will feel invisible. Thank you. Thank you.